Başka? Bildim, bildim. in the introduction that um, they will be building microphones around, so, yeah. so I'll keep an eye on the app, but nothing comes in here. <laughs> okay. I think you, you can run things. Test, test, bir, iki, bak, test. First of all, I would like to express our deep gratitude to Nuketech for the networking launch. And our conference is continuing. So uh, I would like to invite the delegate to use the conference app where we will find information on the program, speakers, sponsors, uh, exhibitors, general information about Baku and Azerbaijan, WCO news, etc. So you can use it, uh, the conference app, WCO events. You can load it uh, from Apple and Google Play Store so, and search for, uh, for WCO events. Uh, there will be QR code for VSEP your smartphone. Uh, the QR code is available on the conference website. By the way, our you know, Wi-Fi is a media center. It's free, so you don't need any password. And delegates can communicate amongst each other through this app and learn more about the social events. So using this conference app, posting, sharing, commenting, liking, you're actually taking part in a competition and have a chance to become the networking genius. Uh, the app and the prizes in the competition are sponsored by uh, Huawei. Uh, so uh, our prizes, uh, if it's interesting for you. So first prize is a Huawei MacBook X Pro laptop. The second prize is the Huawei, the app, um, so the, the Huawei P30 mobile phone. And the third prize is the Huawei Pet M5 tablet. So find more information on the competition through the app and its networking genius icon where you can read the terms and conditions of the competition. The winners will be announced on the last day of the conference. The winners have to be physically present to receive the prize. So we have a tweet account also has been open for the conference. Uh, so I invite all of you to follow us. 2019 WCOIT and WCOOMD and to use the hashtag uh, 2019 WCOIT. So uh, on the first day, what about our dress code? So it's formal and the second and third day, it will be uh, more uh, casual. So dear gentlemen, without ties. So 
transportation is being provided to delegates from Bulgar Hotel to Heydar Aliyev Center and also to the social events in the evening. Details on transportation will be provided accordingly, but the delegates can address the Azerbaijan customs staff at a dedicated information desk in both the Heydar Aliyev Center and the Bulgar Hotel lobby for more information. So the bus is going to a gala dinner tonight. We'll be leaving the Heydar Aliyev Center right after the conference proceedings at 18th. The buses will be taking back the delegates at 22.30 back to the Bulgar Hotel. So uh, for the tour on Friday, the delegates are invited, starting from the afternoon to register at a dedicated desk in the registration area. So there is a limited number that can uh, take part, uh, maximum at uh, 200 uh, delegates, so uh, I think you should be in hurry in order to uh, participate in our tour. The registration for the tour will be on a first come, uh, first service basis. The information on the tour is available on the website and the conference app, as I said before. Uh, thank all the um, volunteers who are making this tour possible. Thank all of you that you are helping us uh, during the conference, including the transfers and providing all logical arrangements. So, uh, uh, who would like to learn more about the culture of Azerbaijan to go to registration area where there will be the staff of the Minister of Culture who will be delighted to give you more information and flyers. So, and now I would like to uh, introduce our first session which will be round table moderated by Mr. Christopher Clark. Nice to meet you. Uh, managing editor for trade and globalization at the Economist Asia. Uh, so, first of all, I would like uh, to say that this uh, first session will be uh, about the governments can, uh, how uh, governments can reap the benefits of technologies and whether the strategies for digital transformation have been adjusted to the accelerated pace of change. Uh, so, and a bit uh, little uh, short bio about Mr. Christopher Clark. Uh, so, Mr. Clark is a senior editor for the Economist Intelligence Unit Ford Leadership Division in Asia. He is an expert in international trade and trade policy and has also advised clients throughout the Asian region on the strategic implications of megatrends and political risk. He was a consultant in the Economist Intelligence of Tokyo office and was the project leader and editor for the publication, The World of 20 and 50. So let's start the first session, please. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Great, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I suppose I can avoid introducing myself now then. Um, welcome back uh, to lunch, everyone. Uh, this, for what I think is going to be a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, this morning, um, in the keynote speeches, and as I'm sure you all see out in the hall with the booths, technology uh, is developing rapidly. Um, but what I think we want to get at in this session is to talk about the practicalities of, of, of technology how it's being applied, what are the challenges um, with cross-border data flows and privacy, and of course, what are the opportunities. So um, I think we have a great panel to hit all of those points and, and others over the next 90 minutes. Um, <clears throat> as was mentioned, there's the, the conference app uh, where we would be trying to accept questions. Uh, the Wi-Fi has been a bit patchy up here, so I'm not sure that's going to work, but I will be keeping an eye on the app. So if you have, uh, have questions, um, Please submit them via the app. Otherwise, we will have roving mics going around uh, for uh, questions the more traditional way. Uh, so the way this is going to work is we'll have two opening rounds uh, where each one of the panelists will discuss an issue um, of, in an area of their expertise. Uh, and then we'll open up to the floor. Um, and if there aren't any questions, then I'll continue on uh, asking with the discussion or uh, asking questions to further the discussion. So immediately to my right, we have already heard from him today. Uh, Dr. Kunio Mikuria, uh, Secretary General of WCO. Uh, to his left is Mr. Benedetto Mineo. He's the Director General uh, Customs and Monopolies Agency in Italy. And then to his left is Mr. Min Don, Vice President and CIO of uh, Canada Border Services Agency. And then next in line we have Mr. Ulrich Vestergaard, Dep Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. Uh, next to him, Mr. Richard Morton, uh, Secretary General of IPSCA. And all the way down in the end, you can barely see him, is uh, Tom Isherwood. He's a partner in the Middle East office for McKinsey & Company. Um, so with the introduction, introductions out of the way, 
Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to start with you, uh, Mikuria san um, the, the WCO has, has put together a sort of a study group or, or, or produced a study report on disruptive technologies. And we've been, as I mentioned, we've been talking about disruptive technologies all morning. So what, what were the conclusions of that report? It sort of in brief, the key, the key takeaways. And um, what are some of the challenges that the report and the research identified in implementing technological solutions in, in the custom space? Well, thank you. Um, we issued a report on disruptive technologies. But uh, um, first of all, disruptive means a bit negative, but uh, we don't see it in that way. Disruptive uh, in the sense of disrupting the well, usual way, everyday uh, way of running a business. But then um, it could uh, really uh, provide innovation. So from that point of view, first uh, uh, we try to raise awareness of what uh, technologies are there and what the customers should uh, uh, have eyes on that development. And one good example is, of course, uh, blockchain. And uh, this morning already uh, uh, there are many talks about uh, um, blockchain, so I don't dwell on too much. But uh, um, how uh, blockchain is essentially developed among, um, well, business sector. Um, first, it was more on financial sector, but uh, uh, there was a belief that perhaps in the logistic world, it is very well adapted. So uh, this is why we are trying to enter into that network, uh, being, uh, emerging network, so that customer is not left out from that uh, blockchain. Because blockchain, it is really end-to-end -end information sharing, and so uh, we are very much interested because our supply chain starts from the origin, uh, export, transit, import, and destination. But if the, uh, in doing so, there are so many players, and they hand that information, so there might be uh, some uh, missing uh, elements and uh, some, or even some fraudulent activities could be possible. But uh, if that uh, blockchain uh, constantly uh, keeping pace, uh, updating the data with the same and uh, validated, this will be a very good uh, well, uh, uh, tool for, the, for, for customs. So uh, we try how to um, integrate uh, that blockchain into customs. And uh, I push all uh, customer administration, whenever there are opportunities, please uh, join that uh, initiative. And uh, um, once they, uh, we receive more information, experience, then perhaps we can develop uh, best practice and even standards. Because in the end, it is data sharing. So, so you need a standardized data set. And another area is, uh, um, is rather uh, AI or um, well, artificial intelligence. And I already see many uh, usage of machine learning in customs. Um, well, customs is first uh, uh, well, engaged in revenue collection and how to well, uh, make sense of data and uh, come up with patterns of uh, data and uh, uh, to uh, use that for detecting irregularities, whether it is uh, um, finance area or uh, illicit trade. And uh, this is what uh, we want to push. But for that, uh, of course, we need uh, human resources that, uh, um, well, data analytical uh, well, capability should be developed in customs. So this is what uh, um, another area that we are pushing. Internet of Things, uh, this is another area. It is more on, um, well, locating, well, from customs point of view, locating where containers are, where packages are. And uh, uh, that tracking methodology is uh, combined with, for example, drones and others. Uh, it could give us a very good insight. So uh, again, uh, several customer administrations have already started uh, in using that one. And uh, one area that we want to see is that uh, we often use scanners and the images that customers uh, take. And uh, um, leverage on that uh, IoT and how we can really uh, connect those images and data uh, so that uh, um, we can uh, promote coordinate border management and uh, customs, customs cooperation so that we can have more facilitation and also control. So this is what uh, we uh, produce and we recommend to our members. But 
would you say that it's still, I mean, there's a lot of excitement and there's long been excitement around IoT, more recently uh, AI, uh, and of course blockchain. And it sounds like there's been some early adoption, but how long do you think it will be before the, these technologies are more widely used? Well, um, for example, uh, we are now constantly using smartphones. But 10 years ago, no, mm -hmm. we didn't really use that. But nowadays, people are just watching uh, uh, everywhere. So that will come very quickly. Okay. So this is why uh, we are pushing uh, uh, for that, to, that customers should not be uh, well, missing the bus. Mm -hmm. That is uh, digital uh, uh, econo economy uh, based on technology. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Ulrich, um, the OECD has done a, a report of their own sort of in this area, um, the, the Going Digital Project. Um, given what mikurio san just said, what, what sort of things did that research find in the area of, of customs and border management? Well, thank you very much. Um, we, we have uh, embarked on this project that you call Going Digital. Uh, from, from the outset, we thought that it doesn't make sense anymore to talk about a digital economy because the whole economy is now digital. And I think what we've seen over the last 60 years is basically uh, a dramatic increase in computing power and at the same time a dramatic decrease in cost, which has then enabled us to develop this more and more interdependent uh, ecosystem of uh, digital technologies. You've already mentioned a few of them, IoT, blockchain, AI. I think what is new and what is so complex also for customs authorities is that this ecosystem is actually interdependent. It's very, very difficult to take one away without affecting the others. They need each other uh, to, to, to thrive and to uh, evolve into game changers for, for our economies and our societies. But I would say that the real game changer really is data. And I think it was The Economist who famously last year put that on the front page saying that data is the new oil of the economy. I think, I think at the OECD we would subscribe to that. We think that is true. This is also why we need to make sure that there is a, a fairly free flow of data. Uh, this is where the customs authorities come in, of course, because there are also uh, legitimate concerns about consumer protection, illicit trade. We could also talk about uh, privacy and security, which are also issues that could legitimately hamper the, uh, the, the completely free, free flow of, uh, of, uh, of data. But we need to find ways of regulating at the border that will be least uh, restrictive uh, to, to, to trade. I think also this whole development will spur a lot of innovation, also a lot of digital innovation that could actually help uh, customs uh, authorities, but it's, it's clear also that there will be challenges, uh, for example, when it comes to uh, finding out whether to regulate uh, based on offline rules or online rules. Uh, we did a report recently called Unpacking E-Commerce, and we basically identified three different uh, business platforms, if you like, or business models for, for e-commerce. One is the business model that uses platforms. We all, all know uh, that you can go online and then you can uh, order a a book at an at a, a online retail uh, shop, I won't mention the obvious one, um, and, and then you can have that book delivered. Uh, the second one is what we call subscription service business model, where you subscribe, you have a recurrent amount that you pay, and then you get uh, some sort of uh, uh, continuous provision of products. That could be, for example, music streaming. And the third one, and that's not the, the, not the least difficult one, I think, for custom authorities is where you have a mix of offline and online uh, where, for example, uh, you, you sort of scan the market online, but then you go to, to a brick and mortar shop like in the old days and then you buy the product. These are the three different models uh, that we have identified. More will evolve and they all raise questions about uh, uh, how to deal uh, with, uh, with, uh, with trade at the, at the, at the border. Uh, I'm, I'm no expert on that. We just heard from the, uh, from, from, from the expert, uh, but we have a very, very good uh, cooperation between the WCO and the OECD also on issues such as trade facilitation and, uh, and uh, illicit trade and how to combat that. And I'm, I'm, I think actually that cooperation will be uh, even more important uh, uh, in the future. One, just let me finish on that, just, just one thing that we have seen over the last uh, couple of years is that due to some of these developments, we see that, that transactions at the border become more numerous and they become smaller. So we see more post parcels at the border. They could contain sneakers or headphones. Uh, that's one effect of, of the business models that I just, uh, uh, just described. Actually, we've seen that parcel trade has grown three times faster than, if you like, normal trade volumes in the world. So this is certainly one of the things 
where we need digital innovation to help customs authorities deal with uh, this new development. I want to go back just briefly for s something you said that's it's, it's a very important topic, and I'm not sure that you have an answer to this one, but the, the issue of data and cross-border data flows. I mean, is there any discussion of that within the OECD, and is there, um, do you think there's an international forum where those rules and standards and regulations can be reliably developed and enforced? It would be tempting to say that I can't answer it, because then I wouldn't have to dive into it, because it's an extremely contentious uh, <laughs> issue. Uh, already now, discussions are going on. They started this spring at the WTO uh, on, on e-commerce, or what we at the OECD call digital trade. But even here, there is no consensus worldwide that WTO is necessarily the right forum for tackling this. This is why only, I think, about 70 countries have signed up to the negotiations so far. Others say that they're not ready. They should take place elsewhere. But this, I think, goes to the heart of what some have called the digital iron curtain or, 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 or the splinter net, because what we're actually seeing here is, is four different regimes for how to, uh, how to deal with the cross-border data flows. Uh, some have no regulation at all. That's a problem because it can, it can actually hamper uh, countries from exporting to these uh, uh, countries. Some have ex-post regimes, uh, some have ex-ante uh, recognition regimes, and some have case-by-case -case regimes. The case-by-case -case regimes is where you have to have every single uh, transaction allowed. This corresponds you know, to very, very different perceptions around the world of who owns our data. If you ask in Europe, most people are likely to say that the individuals own the data. If you ask in the US, most people are perhaps likely to say, well, it's the market, it's the big tech companies, they own it, you gave it to them. If you ask maybe in China or Russia, they would say that it's the state or the party. Or if you ask in, in, in least developed countries, they would say, what data? We don't have any, we don't have any collection of data. So this goes to the, to the, the, to the, 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 the core of a, a very important uh, question for the future concerning uh, a free flow of data. Um, I think personally that it's already too late to have this harmonized, but what we should work at is some sort of interoperability between these regimes before they splinter into domains that are not compatible. So I'm going um, hmm. to move down to the end um, and ask Tom to bring in maybe the, the exper your experience working with the private sector and the, and the public sector on, on some of these technology issues. What, what role do you see for the private sector in some of, this, some of these uh, technology implementation uh, issues and de cross-border data and other, other issues? Yeah, so this, this is a good question. This question of how will technology affect trade is a question we get a lot from our private sector clients, whether they're technology companies looking at serving traders or people involved in flows, or whether they're actually just the traders themselves, the multinational companies that are, that are driving uh, trading goods. Um, and, uh, and so maybe let me talk a bit about actually what we see there, and then what would that mean for customs agencies? Um, so we, uh, we did some research last year where we looked at uh, 23 global value chains collectively making up about 96% of global trade. And for each one we dug into, um, you know, where, how are the flows moving around from different countries, um, what drives cost in those flows, and, and to what extent is technology changing how those flows are working. Um, and if you, if you really just try to simplify across all of this what this means for the private sector, most of these technologies, whether it's IoT or AI or automation, most of this results in um, lower cost, a lower transaction cost for the private sector. So trade gets cheaper. Um, and that happens with IoT because you can track your shipments, which lets you manage your warehousing better and your inventory better. It happens in logistics and warehouses because uh, you, can, you can use optical recognition to scan items in warehouses. You can uh, use um, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of advanced robotics for um, uh, uh, fulfilling uh, in your warehouse. Um, and, and so all of this represents lower cost for private sector. Um, now, and we see some adoption, by the way, because if you, if you look at this, we think the potential for for uh, automation and for cost reduction in the logistics sector is, is significant. If you take all economic sectors uh, in the economy, we think uh, logistics and warehousing is probably number two or number three in terms of the sheer potential for automation to just remake the sector. Um, and, and you can see some people starting to roll this out. And so, you know, there's uh, uh, large logistics players, um, you know, who already invested more than a billion dollars in automating major centers. Um, and, and warehouses. There's startups that have put on prototypes for fully automated warehouses. That's not really scaled up yet, but it's in the pilot stage. Um, and, and so you can imagine that there's huge potential here. The thing we were surprised to see, though, is that the adoption rate in the private sector in logistics has actually been slower than we expected um, compared to other sectors. 
the main reason for this is, is just that it's a very low margin sector, and so there's a lot of risk in major technology investments, and it's not quite clear yet which technology is the right one to invest in. Um, and so, so I guess if you think about what does this mean for the private sector, it means um, you know, lower cost of trade, significant uh, potential for technology, but a bit slower rollout than we've seen than we were expecting at first. What does that mean for customs agencies? Um, in my mind, it means three things. First, in some ways, it does increase the challenge. As um, cost goes down for the private sector, that means more trade. And it also means that smaller trade and smaller parcels, as we were mentioning, becomes um, more feasible. Um, and and e-commerce has obviously been driving a lot of that as well. Um, so I think in one sense, it means there's more challenges for customs agencies in terms of volumes of declarations and um, complexity of uh, declarations. Um, secondly, uh, I, I think there's a real imperative on, the, uh, on customs agencies to seize this moment and try to um, collaborate very actively with the private sector players that are implementing these new technologies. Um, because there's a huge opportunity here, whether it's with partnering with um, an e-commerce platform for data sharing to actually get around the fact that it's small parcels because you have a platform in the middle where you can aggregate the data, um, whether it's working with, there's large manufacturers that are already starting to open up their internal data systems to customs brokers because they want to prevent uh, kind of translation of errors through the supply chain. So if there's an error at one stage of the supply chain, they want to make sure that at the next port, the broker can access the original data, not just copy-paste the error from the previous port. And so we're already seeing companies open up their books to, um, to brokers. Um, this is an opportunity for customs agencies to also try to seek the same kind of access um, to information, which, which ultimately could be win-win. It'll, it'll reduce uh, time for clearance. It'll increase transparency for companies. Um, and, and finally, I think the biggest opportunity is for customs agencies to take these same technologies and deploy them themselves. And I think, in particular, um, the low-hanging fruit in my mind is, I think blockchain has huge potential, it's, it's, it's tricky to get there. But I think the low-hanging fruit is really around um, analytics and uh, AI is a complicated word, and we all kind of mean different things by it, but at least data analytics, like data, there's huge potential even today. You know, even with fragmented systems, customs agencies already sit on a lot of data. Um, and there's already a lot they can do with it to, um, to, to make it so that good traders go through faster and uh, they can focus their interventions on the, the harmful or the uh, problematic trade. All right, thanks for that. Um, what's, in your experience uh, at IPSCA, what Tom mentioned reducing costs, technology reducing costs, improving efficiency, uh, and also noted some of the challenges that adoption faces, uh, technological adoption faces. What, what, what are you seeing in the maritime industry in terms of uh, technological adoption, what are the biggest challenges uh, the industry faces? Um, normally, uh, what we see is actually for technology, the biggest problem are people. It's not the technology, it's the people. It's changing mindsets. And we've found that throughout not just the maritime industry, but the air industry. When you need to start collaborating and sharing information with your competitors or potential competitors, the problem is changing the mindsets. Um, but the challenge we have with technologies is that technologies seem to be driving business processes now. And actually, it should be the other way around. The reason we want to share data is to, to complete a process, whether it's a custom export notification, import declaration, a manifest. So we need to make sure that the business processes are driving the technology. And you pick the most suitable technology to help. Because the problem is if you let technology lead, we have a lot of talk about blockchain. It has its purpose, it has its place. But there are still issues about how much is it being used in the industry. Uh, one customs authority said to me, their head of IT, she said, blockchain, I like the idea. Which one do we use? How many times do we as a small customs authority have to implement different blockchain technologies mm. in order to make sure that we can match the need to trade and help trade facilitation? And she had no answer to that. She was, she was confused. She didn't know where to start. So I think those types of things are very important. Um, also, the challenges of standards. We know the World Customs Organization does a huge and very good job on their data model. And their data model themselves is hugely important for the industry. But it's focused around customs. I know it's developing. But if you look at the maritime industry, they use the EDIFAC standards. Uh, if you look at the air industry, they're using the IATA standards. And just one example, if you take a port of arrival for customs, it generally means quayside. 
a port of arrival for a maritime authority means port territory, which is a different place. <laughs> so we need to make sure that the standards organisations, they already work together, but they need to work closer together because we all need to be talking the same basic language, the same semantics. We need to know what data element means what. And as we go to share more and more data, if we don't do that, it's a problem. There's one example of a, uh, organized, um, an IT company that developed blockchain for releasing a container out of a port. So we asked the question, container, what do you mean by a container? And they said, but it's just a container. They hadn't specified whether it was a reefer container, a 40-foot container, a 20-foot container, uh, a chemical container. And that's important when you're doing for customs risk management. You need to know sp precisely what it is so you can see if there's a risk that that type of container may cause um, for your safety and security measures. So there are a huge number of issues in that respect um, in how to do it. And when you talk about cross-border, what legal framework do we have for sharing data cross-border? And um, where does data protection come into it for personal goods? So we talk about, oh yes, but it's business to business. Well, if you have a bill of lading, a person has signed that or has authorized it if it's electronically, and you're sharing that along the supply chain. What happens if five years' time they say, I want to be forgotten, as you can under the European GDPR regulations? How do you extract that one person out of that business to business document? If it's a business to government, it's slightly different because you have regula uh, regulatory requirements. So the industry, and on a final note, is taking forward technologies to help it make the cost reductions. But I think there are two issues that come down. One is, how are those cost reductions for the main logistics industry being passed on to the final consumer? I'm not convinced at the moment that they are. And secondly, how do customs authorities keep up with the pace of industry? Because by the time the customs authorities have generally caught up, the industry is doing something else. So we need to try and stream them together and have a better working collaboration between industry and the regulatory authorities in order to make sure we're parallel streaming the technology because otherwise you're going to end up with multiple different streams going at different paces. Mm. You, yeah, you mentioned at the outset that, that the, the people are the problem, right? And I don't think that's, that's not limited just to the, the customs industry, right? It's governments, regulators all over the world have a problem. I mean, it's whether it was financial services two decades ago, and now it's all sorts of technology, and the government, much as they may want to keep up, they struggle to uh, attract the right talent. So how, is, there, is, that just, is that problem just going to persist, or are there some ways, ways to make improvements there? I think it's a problem we'll have constantly, mm. but it's about opening mindsets. It's about making sure that people think that the data that they have can be used for other reasons. You don't want to share commercial data, of course. But what more? Can you monetize that commercial data that you have so that actually you're limiting your risk? But the biggest issue is mindsets. You have to change mindsets. And if you don't change the mindsets, it happens. We know with port community systems that have been exchanging data electronically for over 40 years in some cases still have the problems of mindsets. People who have been using the systems, as soon as you implement something new, well, do I need to use it? Can I share the data? It's not my data, it's somebody else's data. So you have to bring people together in a neutral form, a forum in order to help them understand. Uh, we see customs authorities. Customs authorities for tax uh, secrecy laws cannot share data or certain data. So as soon as you start talking about single window and sharing data, you need to come out, overcome regulatory requirements. So some of those issues around people also link to the regulatory environment and having to change legal aspects in order to be able to share and exchange that data. Right. Well, Min, I saw you nodding your head a little bit during, during the course of that exchange. What, what is, what's been CBSA's experience with technological adoption, keeping up with the pace of change of technology, um, changing maybe mindsets within, within the, the border service? Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the, your experience in this area. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, CBSA's challenge, the so Canada Border Services challenges are, are, are a challenge that you've heard throughout the day. Right, so volumes are going up, um, manpower and, and uh, throwing more people at it is not a 
long-term solution and, and we have the same problem which is essentially in a nutshell you need to lower the cost per transaction at all the borders right so in CBSA the border is air land marine postal they're all borders and they're all very high touch um, it's it's using even some newer technologies but it's still based on, on a human eyeball looking at every single transaction that crosses and every single border so I think in terms of technology adoption getting to your question um, we've heard a lot today, a few that we're leaning heavily into, not so much blockchain, although we have a pilot there and we're, we're hopeful. Um, I think the two, the ones that will really make a difference in terms of lowering that cost per transaction uh, and moving more towards automation. So, so instead of looking for the, the hay, we're looking for the needle. One is artificial intelligence. And, and that is a, a loaded term, I think specifically, and I'll, I'll talk about it, is uh, machine learning. I think it is something that we, that is not as Star Trek as some of the things we hear about AI. It's, it's, it's closer and it's, it's here. Um, that's part of it. And the other one that we, I haven't heard much today is facial biometrics. So I'll, I'll start with the last one. I think in both, so uh, commercial trade and travelers, one of the ways to do more automation is obviously not stop the, the transaction, right? Not stop the traveler, not, uh, not stop the, the truck, the train, uh, the container. Stop it, as, make it as frictionless as possible. And one of the ways to do that when there's humans involved uh, is to move much more into the facial biometrics because what that allows for, there's still a lot of challenges, and I'll speak to that, but really what that allows for is one, it reduces the need for human interaction. Somebody to eyeball the passport to make sure that this is the same person. Um, moving away from things like iris and fingerprint because you have to stop somebody at a kiosk, right? These are inherently slower technologies. They're proven technologies, but they're slower. And if you want to move towards that model where certain uh, countries like Dubai are, you get out of the plane, you walk down a hallway, and if you're good to go, you go right, you pick up your, your luggage and you, you go out and grab your, your taxi, the only way to do that is through things like facial, right? And that has inherent risks as well, but uh, time permitting, I'll get back to that. But moving back to the machine learning, um, what we've done, just to bring a, a practical sense to it, so we have the HS uh, code system, which I think all of you are familiar with, 15,000 codes, uh, importers have to deal with that and kind of decrypt which codes uh, to tag the, the, the product that they're importing. And it's free text, so everybody here is fairly technical. They understand the challenges inherent in dealing with free text form. Um, what some of our folks in, in my team did is said, you know what, that sounds like a problem that's ripe for machine learning and deep learning. So they used Google, Google's TensorFlow. They took 98 million historical records, trained it against it, and said, this is the HS code that was entered, this is the text that came out, and this is what it should have been and in about six weeks. They were able to train a model using uh, publicly available software, train a model that was able to predict with 90% accuracy a free text form what the HS code for six digits should be, right? And that's, and the whole model is about 15 megabytes. And that took about six weeks. Uh, so you think that through, this is not, you know, some of the more far-fetched parts of AI. This is really practical. This is machine learning. The model works. So what we do now is if you, you put that with targeting and others, it's we've got a model. You've got data coming in. We've got about 20 million of these HS codes come in annually. You run it through the model and said, well, for some reason, uh, the model predicted this code, and this is the one that the importer entered. So it could have been you know, an error, an innocent error, or it could be malicious. You may want to look into that, right? So all of a sudden, this is the needle in the haystack. You're not looking through hay looking for a needle. You're saying uh, AI machine learning is saying this might be a needle. No guarantee, but, you know, 90%. Uh, this might be a needle. You might want to look into this. Maybe nothing, maybe something. And that's one of the ways where, you know, with limited human capital, you focus in on the higher value work, right? I think lastly, I'll end on, because you asked some of the challenges, um, what we're still grappling with, not just with CBSA, but the government of Canada in the AI space is the whole question of ethical AI, right? Things like algorithmic bias, things like, you know, uh, uh, data is used to train the AI, the data itself may be biased, there may be program bias in your data uh, around gender, around race, around uh, a number of things, right? And you have to be able to, uh, w when you have a human, the advantage is you can question that human, why did you refer that, that? why did you refer that to secondary, why did you inspect it, why did you ask these questions, why did you do a certain action? Um, with AI, if you're not careful, it's a black box that you can't ask that question. You can't say, why did you do that? So uh, we're, it's uh, slow going. 
the human you know skill set issue is, is one that we, we are challenged with as well but we think that's that's where we will move towards more automation and a more seamless experience um seated to your right is a, another official from um, a customs agency um, so mr Mayo, Mayo, could you talk a little bit about the the your experience in italy with implementing some of these technologies uh, as well as things like drones and scanners how how, have, how, how has that process gone in italy um, and everyone in the audience uh, mr Mineo is going to add uh, answer in italian so you need to put your headsets on yes. yeah grazie per la domanda e permettetemi di ringraziare prima mister micuria per uh, l'invito rivolto di partecipare a questa tavola rotonda eh, con importanti esperti del settore. Ringraziare anche le dogane azzere per la perfetta organizzazione e l'ottima ospitalità. Ecco, andando alla sua domanda, gli scanner. Eh, beh, I porti italiani utilizzano da anni gli scanner, di, abbiamo avuto acquisti di varie tecnologie, però in atto abbiamo un massiccio piano di sostituzione di scanner eh, con scanner di ultima generazione. L'esperienza italiana. Tutti noi sappiamo che eh, non si può sottoporre a controllo tutte le merci, quindi un utilizzo efficace degli scanner è legato a un'importante attività di intelligence che ci permette di effettuare eh, un'attenta analisi dei rischi e sottoporre al controllo il risultato di questa analisi. Eh, Nell'ambito dell'amministrazione italiana ecco, le dogane sono state sempre dotate di una buona tecnologia e la utilizziamo da sempre quotidianamente e in effetti una dogana moderna non può non effettuare cospicui investimenti. Di sostituzione, come nel caso vi dicevo prima, di sostituzione degli scanner, quindi con scanner più moderni, ma anche puntando a prodotti nuovi da sviluppare. Ora, questo non per sostituire eh, come dire, le attività che vengono svolte dal personale al fine di efficientarle, ma anche per eh, elaborare dati e notizie con maggiore precisione. Ora, del resto, lo sviluppo del commercio internazionale ha assunto, grazie alla tecnologia, un notevole sviluppo. Pensiamo ad esempio al commercio elettronico, ma specularmente deve corrispondere eh, una crescita di tecnologie per il controllo sia questo di tipo fiscale che di sicurezza. E, il lavoro ecco, che noi facciamo tutti i giorni, i direttori delle dogane, sono quelli, sicuramente abbiamo, nel lavoro che facciamo c'è una componente diciamo, globale che è, quella, eh, che è il lavoro simile di tutte le dogane del mondo. Poi abbiamo invece una componente locale, la componente locale è quella di eh, come dire, stare, è una componente più rigida, è quella di stare all'interno delle regole, dei trattati internazionali e delle, e delle leggi. Bene, quindi da una parte dobbiamo confrontarci con le multinazionali che muovono parti significative dell'economia e dall'altra con istituzioni nazionali e estere che, si, che scrivono le regole del, eh, della nostra attività e, e non sempre le scrivono come dire, nel, nel senso che noi vogliamo. Eh, dobbiamo quindi allo stesso tempo cosa dobbiamo fare? Dobbiamo sicuramente garantire il rispetto delle normative, lavorare nel limite di un bilancio assegnato e favorire lo sviluppo del commercio internazionale. Per riuscire a fare questo dobbiamo sicuramente utilizzare sistemi informatici affidabili e questo lo facciamo nelle attività quotidiane e eh, come dire, capire e valutare quali saranno invece gli strumenti più utili nel futuro per indirizzare i nostri investimenti. Pertanto deve essere eh, sviluppato un nuovo modello di dogana, deve essere sviluppato un nuovo modello di dogana eh, con tecnologie che vanno, bene abbiamo detto prima, dai droni al, agli scanner, dagli strumenti olfattivi all'intelligenza artificiale, dai sensori ai sistemi di tracciamento, dalla blockchain al riconoscimento facciale. Bene, in, co in coerenza con questo obiettivo, cioè quello di prepararsi alla dogana del futuro, L'Agenzia italiana ha una roadmap di progetti sperimentali, eh, anche di strumenti innovativi, che, po che possono essere posti a supporto delle attività doganali. L'obiettivo primario qual è? È definire eh, la struttura di dati versatili e universalmente adottabili. Quindi da questa struttura di dati, utilizzati bene da un'attività di intelligence, poi si sottopongono le attività ai vari controlli. 
Quali sono, da dove devono venire queste strutture di dati riversatili e universalmente adottabili? Devono provenire da dati e schede informatiche che eh, appunto vengono da imprese e altre amministrazioni trasmesse digitalmente, dai parametri di eh, strumenti di scansione o rilevazione, quindi dati metrici o volumetrici, dati di integrità della materia costituente l'oggetto del target e quindi ripolgo a pareti di containers, vano veicolo, quindi attraverso adozione di sensori basati su tecnologia non invasiva, pensavo a quella per l'interferometria e Raman, e eh, scansione del contenuto di silos, eh, quindi per questo utilizzando, utilizziamo il robot a guida semiautomatica con tecnologie perspettrali o tecnologie Raman, o scansione dei pacchi eh, per più relativi all'e-commerce attraverso l'utilizzo di scanner mobili a terraers e raman. Bene, tutto questo eh, stiamo eh, progettando di adottare anche dei laboratori mobili e su con strumenti di realtà aumentata che possano supportare le attività doganali on-site comunicando quindi in tempo reale ai centri specialistici che possono intervenire da remoto. Bene, queste serie informative di dati eh, costituiranno la nuova base di eh, conoscenza su cui applicare sistemi di analisi tramite applicazioni di intelligenza artificiale che porteranno a rendere eh, ancora più mirati i controlli delle attività di movimentazione delle merci. Siamo quindi tutti insieme impegnati nella costruzione della dogata del futuro. In altre parole, dobbiamo effettuare i controlli fisici e così ci stiamo strutturando noi in casi solamente particolari. Questo vuol dire eh, semplificare le attività delle imprese che rispettano le leggi, eh, trasmettere fiducia ai consumatori, garantire sicurezza alle frontiere e correttezza del, del, eh, dell'adempimento fiscale. Tutto questo porterà grandi benefici. Di fatto, di fatto siamo sicuri che tutto questo porterà a risultati di cui ancora oggi non riusciamo a cogliere la reale portata. Okay, th thank you for that, that, that answer. Um, we're going to go one more round of questions here and then uh, open it up to the audience. Um, coming back to you, Mikuri san one of the technologies we haven't talked a lot about yet um, is 3D printing. Um, now, I do a lot of work um, uh, on illicit trade. And I thought one of the more interesting stories I heard over during the course of my research is that Hong Kong Customs uses 3D printing to print copies of, of, uh, that they can compare to potential counterfeits coming through, coming through Hong Kong. That's obviously, um, I think that's still sort of in the early stages, but it's an interesting application. Um, what, what other sorts of applications of 3D printing, I mean, in the course of doing this research that the WCO did, what, what, what did you see or what did you conclude? Well, 3D printing has, uh, well, um, huge implications for customs because customs used to be focused on physical goods on borders. But nowadays, um, the trade uh, environment has changed and increasingly there is in, there are intangibles and, well, electronic transmissions. And how customs can cope with that is a huge question. And uh, um, 3D printing is one example. Um, currently, 3D printing is more on domestic use, but uh, um, so it could uh, uh, have more implication on tax or police authorities. But why not? In, well, uh, it's an international trade. Uh, and uh, um, you mentioned about uh, uh, counterfeiting, but uh, it could be used for security purposes. Uh, that uh, I, I clearly uh, I saw that uh, uh, firearms uh, reproduced uh, using 3D printing. So uh, um, actually, we have uh, a huge interest. But uh, um, as you know, um, when it comes to electronic transmission, um, the World Trade Organization has a moratorium on uh, imposing uh, custom duties on intangibles, 1998. Yeah. At that time, the reason was to promote more um, digital economy. But uh, nowadays, the reality came back that uh, what we should do. And uh, um, uh, our, well, uh, like WTO, WCO membership uh, still divided uh, how to do that. Right. But uh, um, especially in terms of revenue collection. 
but the, in the area of uh, um, say how to uh, well uh, scale how, how, how to measure the importance of uh, trade is what we are tasked to do uh, and uh, um, actually trade statistics they are all uh, coming from customs but now uh, we have problems in how to measure those uh, cross-border movement of uh, intangibles yeah. and also uh, some uh, um, areas of illicit trade or admissibility of those electronic transfer is uh, uh, what uh, we have uh, to face with. So um, still we are divided, but uh, um, uh, now that uh, um, members uh, are thinking that uh, perhaps uh, in not in the so distant future, we are faced with uh, this question to make sure that customs remains relevant to international trade. Obviously, this is, what's your view on, on customs responsibility for intangible goods, safety, security, risk? Um, you know, Mikuria san mentioned that the, the moratorium might not be extended. So, where, what do you see the role of customs being in, in all of this? It's, it's uh, and I think my, my colleagues touched on it, it's a fastly evolving field, right? And, and intangible goods, I was listening to um, a podcast not too long ago with the CEO of, of, of Spotify, and, and the challenges of, of something like that, a streaming service and things of intellectual properties, it's quickly evolving. I think there, there is a role to play, but right now I, I, I know there's, um, there's a moratorium here, but it, I think what we want to do is continue to have something that you don't hear government talk about often, or at least not, we, we say it, we don't necessarily put it in practice, is, is put the consumer uh, at the forefront of, of some of these decisions, right? And they impact us for sure, and, and, but it, what is the consumer need and the trade-offs around that? In terms of intangibles, it, it's, a hard, it's a really hard market to follow, right? Uh, a lot of the products are now not, not from, sold from brick and mortar, and, and they're, not, uh, they're multinationals. Um, points of presence and, and what is it being sold and how is it, how is it being uh, capitalized and how is it being monetized is, is moving faster than some of our rules and policies can keep up with. Um, to go back to, to Mr. Mneo, um, what, what's, your, what's your view on, on, this, on this issue? Um, how, how can customs agencies collaborate more with, with other stakeholders like the tax administrations, for example? Uh, how, how, do, how do you see that playing out in the next couple of years? Sì. Bene. Eh, sui beni materiali beh, rinvio alle posizioni già concordate con eh, i Paesi dell'Unione Europea che al momento non ci si debba discostare dalla pratica ultraventennale di non imporre dazi doganali sulle trasmissioni elettroniche. Come sapete il tema era stato già posto in occasione dell'ottantesima sessione della Commissione politica dell'OMD e la Commissione europea eh, ha chiesto di stracciare il punto all'ordine del giorno in quanto il ruolo delle dogane è già stabilito dalla moratoria adottata dall'OMC nel 1998. La moratoria ha contribuito alla crescita globale del commercio digitale, con benefici sia per i consumatori che per gli operatori economici. Certamente, tenuto conto della rapida e continua evoluzione tecnologica, non escludiamo completamente la possibilità di confrontarci in un dibattito per la rivalutazione strategica del ruolo delle dogane nelle trasmissioni elettroniche, ma un tale dibattito, a nostro avviso, non può essere confinato solo al, al mondo doganale. Relativamente alla sua seconda domanda, senza limitarmi all'ambito della proprietà intellettuale, le dico che l'attività delle dogane non è solo funzione di specifiche normative doganali, ma abbiamo, e questo è valido più o meno in qualsiasi dogana del mondo, autorità diverse con le quali confrontarci e che rispondono a standard diversi. Eh, tra gli esempi di eh, collaborazione tra diverse autorità che vi posso portare, no, della dogana italiana, eh, faccio il caso della digitalizzazione del cargo manifest e delle informazioni di sicurezza nel trasporto per ittimo, di cui peraltro hanno accettato, accennato anche altri oratori. 
l'altro eh, grado, eh, grado di digitalizzazione consente di mettere in relazione attiva a tutti gli attori della filiera commerciale e di attuare una convergenza fra tutti gli enti e amministrazioni che esercitano controlli sulla regolarità del ciclo di import e export, eh, permettendo di effettuare l'analisi del rischio prima dell'arrivo del merci importo. Attraverso lo sdoganamento in mare, che anticipa eh, l'analisi dei visti delle merci e le svincola prima dell'arrivo in porto, il tempo di sdoganamento si può praticamente azzerare. Lo sdegamento in mare offre eh, riscontri immediati e riduce al minimo i tempi e i costi di stazionamento dei containers. Beh, inoltre eh, abbiamo in itinere un eh, progetto complesso di digitalizzazione eh, delle procedure doganali in tutti i porti italiani che prevede poco, in poco più di due anni l'estensione a tutti i porti eh, di strumenti innovativi di controllo. Eh, beh, questo è solamente un esempio dico, dei, eh, delle tecnologie che si può applicare nel mondo delle dogane di oggi, eh, spero oggi eh, con l'ausilio di tutti voi eh, di poter accrescere queste mie competenze. Grazie. Great, thank you. Um, Ulrich, I want to come back to you. Um, we've talked about e-commerce, these data issues. Um, there, are, there are, I guess, in, in the trade policy parlance, they're called 21st century issues, right? So how are these e-commerce and these technological developments, how are they affecting trade policy, the way trade agreements are negotiated, what the priorities are for, for the negotiators? Well, thank you for that question. I, I think it's important that we don't lose sight of the basic premise of all this, which is that e-commerce holds uh, a tremendous a promise for gains for everyone, really. That, that, that must be the, 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 the basic outset for this uh, discussion. It certainly is for us at the OECD. And this holds true, actually, on, on, on many levels. One is that it, it, it has a promise to make trade more inclusive for individuals, but also for small and smaller producers. Small producers can now much more easily get a cheap asset to, to, to inputs. Uh, they can reach uh, customers worldwide much more efficiently and easily than they could before. The same goes for individuals. They have a huge selection, a, a bigger selection than ever before, and right at their fingertip they can find the cheapest, uh, the cheapest uh, price or the lowest price for their product. But also at the geopolitical level, I think if you ask uh, trade ministers around the world today, they would probably be a little, bit, uh, a little bit disappointed that the WTO has not, after 25 years of existence, produced another major round. The Uruguay round from 94 was the last one concluded. Uh, and I think more and more uh, trade negotiators are pinning their hopes on, on e-commerce negotiations that started a few months ago. Uh, I think, again, around 70 countries taking part in that. So it's not uh, the whole membership of the WTO, but it's what we call a plurilateral uh, agreement. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and speaking also to some of the colleagues at the WTO, I think they would agree that this is perhaps the, 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 the major possible achievement for the WTO over the next uh, year or, or, or two. Um, but there are some challenges here as well, also for customs uh, authorities. One is, we talked about the, 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 the numerous uh, parcels showing up at borders. I think that calls for more, even more efficient uh, trade facilitation. That's, that's one. The second one is, and I would very much agree with what Richard and, 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 uh, and Tom said earlier, I think customs authorities and trade policy decision makers need to work um, uh, more closely together with, uh, with industry because if they are to follow the pace of developments concerning IoT, uh, AI, robotics, uh, you mentioned drones uh, to, to the right here earlier, I think increased collaboration and, and, and adaptation of new technologies is, uh, is, is important for customs authorities. And then thirdly, and that's back to the issue I, I, I mentioned uh, earlier, there are some issues here where we need we want trade, we want also data to flow as freely as possible across borders, but there are also some legitimate uh, regulatory uh, concerns. There are concerns about privacy, there are concerns about security. So that, that would be my final uh, two guiding lights in this discussion. Be one, that we need to make those regimes interoperable so, so that, that legitimate regulation objectives can be met in a way uh, that's interoperable across, uh, across trading partners, that's one. And the second one is we need to do it in a way that is uh, uh, least uh, trade, uh, as least trade restrictive as, as possible. Mm. You mentioned, just quickly to follow up on something, you, you mentioned uh, the, trade, the issue of trade facilitation. Now it's been five years since that agreement was done under the WTO. 
is is it missing something? Is it outdated already? Did they not capture some of the these technologies that that we're we're talking about today, or was this sort of future prepared for in the negotiations? I, I wouldn't call it outdated, and I'm not, a, not an expert, but I'm pretty sure that the trade facilitation agreement is one that has to be renewed all the time. Yeah. And again, I would like to advertise the cooperation between the WCO and the OECD on, on some of this. We're actually constantly exchanging data and trying to, 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 to help uh, each other with trade facilitation uh, indicators. I think that work is, uh, is uh, needed for customs authorities and for trade negotiators to keep pace with what's, uh, what's the challenges for trade facilitation. Okay, thanks for that. Um, just two more questions for the panel and then, then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, Tom, we've talked about a wide range of technologies here this afternoon. Uh, 3D printing, IoT, uh, AI, machine learning, although there's a definitional issue there maybe we don't need to get into right now. Um, is there something we're missing? Is there something that McKinsey's looked at in the course of doing research or advising your clients that you think is going to have a significant impact and not enough people are talking about it in this space? So, so I'm not sure we've missed a technology. I mean, we've, we've listed a pretty long list of yeah. them. But I, but I do think there's maybe, I'd say, two, two angles that uh, I'm not sure we've talked about yet. One um, relates to 3D printing and some of the technologies related to intangibles. The other one uh, is a point related to machine learning and AI. So on 3D printing and, uh, and the flow of intangibles, um, first of all, one thing we're seeing is that actually this is already the majority of the value of trade globally. If you look at these statistics, it doesn't look, at the, look like that. It looks like you know, 75, 80% is tangible goods. Um, but if you look under the surface and you back out from the tangible goods, the value of R&D, the value of IP, the value of everything else, you, you already have more than half of the value of global trade is, is in intangibles. Yeah. Um, and what 3D printing will do and, and what automation will also do is just fundamentally change the economics of production, um, which means that, you know, what we've seen over the last couple of decades, which is a lot of manufacturing and production moving to lower cost environments, that has already started to reverse itself and change because you know, it, it, maybe it was cheaper to move uh, production uh, outside of advanced economies to lower cost environments when labor was a big input. Um, but if labor is no longer a big input to production because of automation, um, then that economic rationale isn't there anymore. What that means for customs agencies is that the, the trade flows will start to look different. We think that there will be less um, purely global trade and a lot more um, regional uh, trade as a lot of production starts to move a bit closer to where the final mm. co consumption is going to be. Right. Um, and 3D printing will be part of that, automation will be part of that, changing the economics of production. So that's kind of one angle that we, um, I'm not sure we've covered yet. The other one is, um, I, and just a brief thing on machine learning, I, I, I fully agree with what um, the point that Min was making. I think that uh, this is, there's so much potential here now um, uh, without any further advances. And I, and I hear, uh, when I, I talk to a, a number of customs agencies, and, and some that we serve and some that we, 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 ha we don't serve, but, um, and many of them have very legitimate reasons why they're nervous about taking advantage of this, or why they don't think that it's ready yet. Um, uh, legacy IT systems that don't talk to each other, um, uh, data that is of, of medium or poor quality, uh, data that's missing, obviously you'd love to have the data of the private sector supply chain, um, you know, if, if you could. Um, but, but in my mind, these are all to some extent excuses. Yeah. Um, customs agencies today already sit on a huge amount of data. And we found even in um, customs agencies that struggle massively with their IT and, and, um, and, and even on operational areas in customs agencies that are underfunded, even in these environments, um, there's, there's already a lot of data they're sitting on. And in a very short amount of time, you mentioned six weeks, we were involved in something that took, I think, 10 weeks. You're able to get tremendous results from um, using machine learning on your data. And so I think that's uh, something we were really surprised by. Um, and, and I think when I talk to customs agencies, I still hear doubt about. But I, I think that's an opportunity today. Right. So you, the, the result of your research is that the reshoring trend is a real one. Maybe, yeah. er, maybe early days, but it's, it's real and it's coming. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's been, um, it, it's harder to see in the data because the Great Recession kind of made all the trade data weird yeah. for, uh, you know, five or six years. Um, but our, our view is that when you parse all that data, the, the reshoring and nearshoring trend is a real one. Okay. Okay, last question before we go to the audience. Uh, sort of the same, same question from you. Is there, is there anything that, that any sort of technology or developments in this area relevant to the maritime industry that we haven't really talked about? this afternoon that we missed and you think are, are vital and, and relevant to these discussions? I think the technologies, again, as I said in the first answer, 
We need to be driven by business processes, and we need to choose the technology that is suitable for those business processes. Sometimes we get driven by technology providers um, down a certain route because they want to sell you something. <laughs> um, but we need to be focused, whether you're in the trade or whether you're in a regulatory authority, a customs authority, you need to focus around what are you trying to achieve? What is the process that we're looking at? What is the data and where is that data coming from? I haven't heard any mention about data quality yet. Um, and actually, the technologies is all reliant on data. How do we know the data that is being put in to start with is quality? And if we're doing a global supply chain, we need to make sure that we can take points in that supply chain and make sure that the quality of the data hasn't gone up or down, and is, or preferably gone up, of course, um, that we ensure that that data, when we get it, is of high value to us, and that we can make the right decisions on risk, on security, on safety, and those things. But I see there are three implications that we see around all these technologies. The positive ones are interoperability because the more platforms that can communicate together, the higher the quality of the data. The transparency, we have much more transparency in the supply chain. And people, people and customs officers and uh, clerks and freight forwarding offices are able to bring in information much better and make better decisions in order to help supply chain. But negatively, the three same points, interoperability because if you have interoperability, it damages business models of some of the platforms that are out there, or the technology providers. It's the old videotape argument of VHS or Betamax. Um, you, go, you drive yourselves down one route. So that can be a negative effect of what we're talking about. Transparency. Do you want your competitors to see some of the data on what you're doing? So again, a negative impact. Do you want the regulatory authorities to know what cargo you're moving, depending on where you are and how you're doing it? And again, people. Again, coming back to people. Information overload. Technology helps. But how many of us here have WhatsApp, WeChat, WCO um, app, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook Messenger, um, text messages, emails? And how many times do we get the same message to nearly all of them? How, how soon will it be is before we as humans have information overload? And we have to manage that much better than we are at the moment. So I think there are technologies that are out there. And six months' time, there'll be a new technology. A year's time, there'll be a new technology. It's how we use that technology to assist us in making cross-border trade easier. OK, thanks for that. Um, I am not able to access the app, so I apologize for anybody who uh, sent a question via the, the WCO events app. But if you do have any questions, sort of stick your hand up, and we got some people moving around with the microphone. Um, so we'd like to take some questions from the audience. We've got about 20 minutes left or so. Um, so we're still waiting while we're doing that. Um, I want to come back to the trade facilitation agreement for a minute. Um, Ulrich mentioned that you were the WCO and WTO are actually working together, and I asked a question about whether, you know, it's five years old now, right? And we're talking about how fast technology is developing, and there's a new one six months from now, or a new one from a year now. How, how, do, how does the, the trade of facilitation was, was a, a seen as a major accomplishment for the WTO after the failure of the Doha round, and um, how, how does that, how does the trade facilitation fit in, agreement fit in with all of this that we're talking about uh, today? Well, thank you. Um, trade facilitation agreement was, uh, well, major achievement of WTO and uh, WCO is, uh, um, well, helping uh, uh, implementation of WTO agreement. But at the same time, uh, in response to your questions, there are areas that we have to do work more. Right. And uh, uh, WTO agreement is based on WCO's device code convention, which is about customs uh, simplification and harmonization. And uh, now we are trying to review if uh, uh, we can move forward uh, um, uh, to uh, always uh, in consistency with the trade facilitation agreement. Mm -hmm. One area that uh, OECD has mentioned is, uh, for example, free trade zone that uh, uh, we have problems yeah. and do we need to do more um, regulations? 
or even um, nowadays uh, free trade agreement is there, but uh, um, how about rules of origin? Mm -hmm. uh, Procedure-wise, uh, that uh, could be really a uh, well, uh, barrier for mm -hmm. using that uh, trade, uh, free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. So those areas uh, are we are uh, trying. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, also uh, in the area of e-commerce, mm -hmm. um, um, people are talk about, uh, talking about uh, data. And, uh, um, and also small uh, parcels arriving at the borders, and we are really um, faced with that because this is a game changer for consumers and small and medium enterprises, so we want to facilitate, mm. but at the same time, we want to control against illicit trade or uh, even uh, fraud. So uh, we have uh, developed our framework of standards mm. uh, and uh, um, last year and we are now finalizing it uh, for implementation and uh, um, how to ensure that uh, data is quality one. Mm. So for that we need more um, partnership with the private sector mm. and also uh, standardization of data right. and uh, using uh, scanners because uh, um, we need to use uh, scanners but uh, um, how best we can uh, identify uh, uh, irregularities. Uh, perhaps there we can use uh, uh, artificial intelligence mm. that not only uh, human but also uh, machine learning could be used. Mm. And uh, finally, um, it is about data, and uh, uh, I fully agree that uh, we need a change of mindset that uh, don't, um, well, outsource uh, data analysis to, uh, that, uh, uh, from customs, but uh, customs officers should be well trained mm. and even recruited uh, so that they can use data science, which is quite often uh, software is uh, open source and free of charge mm. and uh, how best we can um, um, upgrade our human capacity mm. to deal with that is uh, one area that we have to do and in the end we need more collaboration mm. uh, in the area of um, uh, not only WCO, WTO, but OECD, and uh, in the maritime area, we are working with international maritime organization mm. to use our data model, how it could be used in the maritime environment. So uh, this is the area that we are trying. Mm. So look for any hands up. We got one, okay, we got one in the middle there, so if you could walk the mic over to the, the gentleman in the middle. Okay, um, it's an excellent um, con uh, conference. Sorry, it's a bit hard, to, bit hard to hear you. Okay, okay. Um, my, uh, my name is Jimmy Pang from Hong Kong uh, Supply Chain Security Association. I think uh, thanks a lot for WCO and also uh, Azerbaijan's government to organizing this event. I think it's a great event to having a platform for us to exchange and learn from each other. Um, I remember early this morning, um, uh, uh, Chairman mentioned uh, through the discussion, challenging the speaker. This is one of the ways to learn something today. Okay, um, I got a question is about uh, the blockchain. Um, actually, uh, we know that uh, in the industry, uh, from the commercial sector side, uh, because of the, uh, no matter it's from the, from the data production reason or from the uh, counterfeit issues, uh, a lot of people, they're developing the blockchain solutions for them, for themselves or for the industry. And uh, as WCO got a very unique um, position, uh, connecting the whole world or the, most of the customs. And also, besides WCO, other agents like, um, uh, and other organizations like WTO or maybe Arceo, ATA, or uh, uh, just mentioned uh, the, uh, uh, the Mar Marine side as well. And we know everyone also looking into this matter. Um, at, at, this, at this stage, do WCO have any guideline or um, any uh, standard or platform which is allow the industry to share, to learn? Um, because uh, when, every, uh, when the industry building their own blockchain, they may also concerning to the government or any um, authority, they have any direction or con concern. If there's any guideline can releasing and which is helping the industry or other or, NGO or organization which are moving forward faster? That is my question. Catch all that? Yep. 
Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, your question is very much relevant because uh, I would like to use this conference to start uh, considering on how best we can collect more uh, best practice and moving towards guidelines. Because uh, for now, already uh, expressed, uh, there are so many um, emerging blockchains and interoperability is not assured. And what kind of data uh, that uh, we use in the uh, blockchain not really standardized and uh, um, how uh, we can ensure the well, confidentiality, uh, well, uh, that uh, security concern not uh, um, still addressed. So uh, I'm pushing for any administrations that have that pilot project, please do that and come back to me and uh, uh, so that uh, uh, I can work with other international organizations to the relevant one to develop more guidelines. So this is a really uh, well, uh, um, good um, platform to develop uh, for the future blockchain. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? While we're waiting, I'll just... Uh, Min, what, in Canada, what's, what's, what's been your experience with attempting to use any sort of blockchain technologies, sort of the Canada-specific answer to the more general question that um, Kriya Sun got. Sure. Um, so we see it as a potential. I think it's, it's something we see perhaps in terms of maturity, at least in the government context, we're not quite there. We have two pilots uh, ongoing, both one in commercial and trade with um, partnering with Maersk and IBM for the trade lens. So I'm a little bit limited there in terms of, of what I can, I can share here at this forum, uh, suffice it to say that we're, we're uh, cautiously optimistic on, on some of the outcomes of the pilot. Uh, on the traveler side, um, there's something called known traveler digital identity. So it's, it's with, uh, primarily with Accenture, also using blockchain, that I can speak a little bit more about. Um, and it's essentially leveraging some of the inherent benefits of blockchain around trust, around uh, non-repudiation, around, you know, uh, guarantee that it, it, uh, it is what it should be and it hasn't been tampered with. And, and in terms of that space of traveler, the concept in a nutshell is essentially uh, in, in a travel continuum, it doesn't start just when you get on the plane. Or, or in your car, but let's take a plane for example. It starts from the time you go on Expedia and you book your ticket, right? And and that's where, uh, that's where in general it starts until the time where you get out of the airport in Canada and you get in a, a cab and you get into maybe another hotel. And that's an entire continuum where identity is king. Uh, in our world, identity is king. Data is king, but data is identity. We need to know who you are and we knew, need to know that with a high level of assurance. The, the, the opportunity, though, with blockchain is through that continuum, there's many different public and private partners that have a stake and a say in that identity chain. Right? It doesn't matter if it's Expedia to book your ticket or hop or any of these companies, the airlines, the, the car rental, uh, the local airport, the domestic, the international airports, the airlines. Uh, a lot of people can contribute to your identity at various levels of assurance of that identity. So we are uh, also looking at that in terms of the traveler space, using the inherent benefits of blockchain around trying to solve that identity challenge. Right? So from a border perspective, we have a, a role in that identity. We care at a high level of assurance you are who you say you are, but how can we participate in that longer chain mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully again make it um, more efficient and automated in our perspective, right? right? And uh, make it a better user experience for the traveler. Right, right. So uh, you mentioned case studies. Have, uh, Tom, have you, McKinsey does lots of case studies, I imagine. Have you come across any case studies in this area that you think would be useful for, for these, these sorts of situations and setting standards and rules? No, look, I think I would just say two things here. I think one is a note of caution and one is maybe a call for action. I think the, the note of caution is blockchain in particular you know, we've, we've done, we did a report a couple years ago on the 15 big technologies that we think are going to reshape everything you know, in the private sector, across sectors, not just about trade, not just about customs. Blockchain was one of them. Um, but in terms of the speed at which they're being adopted, blockchain is one of the ones that's taking the most time to figure out. And that's not just true for customs. It's also true even in the places where it has the most obvious applications. It's true in the financial sector. It's true with banks. Yeah. Um, the, the hype is, is much, much bigger than what's actually been implemented so far. So I think there's a bit of a, a note of caution. And I think that, that, that means, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. I think the kinds of pilots that, that were just described here from CBSA are, are a good example of the kinds of things that um, it makes sense to start experimenting with. If there is a call to action though, I, I actually think 
blockchain is one of the one of the technologies that um, you know requires kind of the the network effect to make it work. And so I think if there's any of these technologies where standard setting is really important and where institutions like the WCO play a really critical role, I actually think the blockchain is probably is probably it. And so um, so that, I think that that's all I would have to add. There's a bit, bit of a note of caution on the, on the hype around it, but also uh, I think there is a real opportunity for standard setting and for um, for kind of collective action around around this technology. Right. Okay. Did you have something to add? Yeah. Just in relation to the question about are there any, is there any work going on relating to blockchain and its usage? The World Economic Forum has a series of papers. It also has a supply chain project that it's working on for blockchain. Uh, they're also doing a study in uh, South America in relation to blockchain for regulatory authorities. So there is a lot of work out there. UN CFACT also um, has a project around blockchain. It's got a white paper in consultation at the moment around blockchain. So there is information out there that has been brought together by experts from around the world considering how blockchain can and can't be used. We see in both the air and the maritime industry hundreds and hundreds of examples of proofs of concept. Um, there are very few that have been taken into operation so far. We're not saying that it won't, but we're saying that there are so many, and many of them are being developed by IT companies um, that aren't using data standards. Um, we keep hearing out there, there are, no data, there are no standards. No, there are standards out there. It's just the IT companies who aren't involved in the logistical process don't know that they're out there, so they create their own proprietary standards, which causes even more confusion in the supply chain. So we need to make sure that those standards agencies are working better together to promote what is out there. Um, UNC fact have the uh, core component library and now the multimodal transport data reference model. We know the WCO data model. We know the IMO reference data model. And that's a really good example of how cooperation is working. So the International Maritime Organization have brought together the WCO who have helped with the data maintenance. Um, they've brought together the ISO, International Standards Organization, and UNC fact to look at the regulatory data model in order to do ship reporting when you arrive in port. And that can be the basis of blockchain technology, of blockchain initiatives. But you're using the same data elements and the same. And that's the really important part, is let's make sure that we're promoting the use of data standards that are out there. And they're interoperable already, but that's the key to it. Mm. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes left. Any one last call for questions? I see a hand up in the back. So my name is a. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Who's, who's speaking? My name oh, is, right there. Okay, sorry, sir. My name is Jonathan Sesang from um, the South African community. Yes, actually, this is an interesting topic because I think we need to really reshape the policies because until recently, the, the allowable amount for personal effects, like in where I come from, is a. Uh, $500, and uh, again with the technology, because of the compression of uh, uh, goods, you may find that uh, you, uh, most of the goods which are traded through e-commerce, some of them, much as they might be small, but they have uh, more than $500. Then again, when it comes to making a declaration, a formal declaration through customs, the amount allowable is any goods below 2,000, you don't make a declaration. But uh, now, with e-commerce and increasing volumes, I think it requires customers to redefine how they conduct their business when it comes to cargo clearance. There's also something which has been missing out with the uh, small uh, cargo parcels, for example, that uh, they were not involving the standards bodies. So I don't know what, uh, maybe the Secretary General can make a comment on that, how they can guide customs. And I think also the customs officers need to be trained on how to use discretion to handle some of these goods because it seems now the volume is going up. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, well, uh, WCO is now finalizing our... Um, 
a framework of standards on cross-border e-commerce and uh, um, several specifications are now we are looking at. So this is one guidance. But also, um, we are doing more regional seminars uh, for how to leverage on e-commerce for the development of your economies. And also, another area is that, uh, well, e-commerce, there are so many data available. And, uh, well, we are talking about big data, but uh, all customer administration have their own big data. And, uh, um, well, data is uh, present-day oil, but um, it's a bit misleading because um, oil, there are countries rich in oil, but uh, data, uh, almost all countries are rich in data. But how to recuperate that is one area, and then how to uh, analyze them is another area. But uh, um, this is the area that uh, um, advanced economies have their own uh, information technology and uh, which is rather legacy uh, system. Whereas uh, um, nowadays uh, all technologies, many technologies with uh, low cost are available. So developing countries can leapfrog that uh, um, uh, introducing their technologies and uh, uh, make sense of e-commerce and turn them into the benefit of their economic development. So this is what uh, WCO is trying to address the concerns of many developing countries and LDCs. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I think unless there's another quick question out there, um, I think we might wrap, oops, sorry, one more down here. This is the, the last question we'll take. Uh, thank you so much for the presentations. Mine is more uh, comment and uh, uh, a question. My name is uh, Dingan Banda. I'm from uh, Zambia Revenue Authority. I think the topics that have been outlined is quite something quite interesting. And uh, from our experiences, I think the issue of data requires a, a really important global drive. Because if you look at um, whether we're talking of big data, blockchain, internet of things, there is some element of movement of data. Okay, there is data which is within customs domain. I think in terms of regulatory environment, that's all right. We're looking at data from third party institutions that are involved in trade logistics. We're looking at data from other jurisdictions, other countries, that also needs to be shared. So I think creating a right environment that will facilitate exchange of data, first within the country, that's more of a concept of coordinated border management within other government agencies, and also with other countries that are involved in the supply chain. Now, one key issue that comes up more often relates to confidentiality of data. Now, how do we create an environment that will enable uh, sharing of data among the related parties and also other jurisdictions? I think this requires a global drive beyond uh, uh, standards bodies like WCO to also involve other bodies. I like what was said around WTO. Do we need to revisit the WTO TFA? Because these are aspects that need to be covered at a global platform that's cross-cutting because the data sources are coming from different sources. I thought that should be one of the issues maybe we need to look at seriously. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that comment. I think that was a good one to close in on. Um, so I'd like you all to th uh, join me in thanking these uh, wonderful pan panelists for what was a very interesting discussion. Thank you. So thank you to all our honorable speakers. And dear Mr. Clark, we are looking forward to you to uh, moderating stream B, which will be after a coffee break. So and now I would like to invite all the delegates for a 30 minute refreshment and contact coffee break sponsored by Bureau of Anjik. And I would like to remind you that we will be back in the plenary at 16 and 55 for keynote speech. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Good luck. <laughs>